family's politics. When you were growing up like that and during the Roosevelt era, were they for, were they generally pro-Roosevelt or were they like my grandmother who called him that man? <laughs> well, of course, Roosevelt was looked upon possibly as the savior of the business structure of the United States. By the time he came in, all the banks had been closed and money was hard up. And I don't think it was so much a question whether you are a Democrat or Republican, or the question of where you're going to survive. Now, my family, my grandfather was a typical elderly gentleman. He was sort of short, robust, and uh, wore a watch across his vest with a fob with a Masonic emblem on it, as most of them did, with a gold walking stick. And uh, he was never active so much in politics because he was very active in the church and was part of building the Methodist church in Milledgeville. What business was he in? He was in the drug business. My grandfather started what was known as the Colvin Kid Drug Company in 1890. And then my father came up and took it over uh, when he was a young man of about 21. And then I moved into taking it over. We stayed in business for 79 years, but back when my grandfather, that was before the days of uh, Jagan's lotion and uh, different kind of toothache drops, he made his own. In other words, they had kids Heinz and honey almond cream and uh, kids one minute toothache drop. And they made all of these things themselves. And in fact, we churned the ice cream in the back alley that we saved at the soda fountain because we were among the first in the state of Georgia to save Coca-Cola. I don't know why we didn't keep the stock. They did buy stock in it, but <laughs> when the Depression hit, they had to sell. They probably bought it on margin and couldn't keep it at that time. <laughs> but the drugstore was really a well-known spot in Georgia, particularly GSCW, which was the school that is now Georgia College at Milledgeville. And at their height, they had 1,600 females. It was a female school, and they wore uniforms in the earlier days. And the majority of the teachers in the state of Georgia came from GSCW. And we had a soda fount. And in the later years, we put a luncheonette in there. And we were famous for our hot dogs. We would split the hot dog in the middle and grill it and put uh, relish on it. And we've had uh, students, graduates from GSCW to say they've driven as much as 100 or 150 <laughs> miles out of the way to come by Coven Kid Drug Company and get one of our famous hot dogs. Because we never did get to produce like the Boston did here in Atlanta. But we did uh, have a lot of business at one time. Were you the first in your family to get involved in politics, or were your I, father or grandfather? My father served on the city council of Milledgeville for one term. Never did run again, so I was faced to really go off the bat and uh, get involved in politics. However, today, my oldest daughter, who is an attorney, a graduate from Emory, is the vice mayor of the city council of the city of Jacksonville. She Jacksonville, is Florida? Jacksonville, Florida. She is the first female to be the vice mayor, and of all things, the first Republican. <laughs> I don't know if she got away from Florida and changed from a Democrat <laughs> to a Republican, but she hopes to be mayor this next year. <laughs> Do you remember any particular influences on your politics, the way they are today, from your childhood, from your father's Well, of course, as I came up through high school and tech, I got involved with politics, you might say. We didn't call it politics, we called it promotion. And at Tech, I was a class officer, president of the senior class. My, yeah, I graduated. What I was, year was that? 1936. Back in those days, uh, the president of the senior class handled the purchasing and selling to the students their graduating ring, their invitations. I was business manager of the Technique, which is a paper that they publish out there. I was on the student council. I was a member of ODK. I was, uh, a an athlete too. I was captain of the basketball team and whatnot. But I made more money my senior year at Tech than ever before. <laughs> but 
Maybe that got me into politics, but I left Tech and worked in Atlanta for a stock and bond house. My, my father had a had heart attack, so I left and went back to run the drugstore. I got back in 38 and was drafted in the service in 41. So my father had retired, but he came back in to take over the drugstore. And I went into the service in January of 42. Weren't you an officer? I was drafted as a second lieutenant. I had gotten that from Georgia GMC, Georgia Military College in Milledgeville, which has been some controversies about it here lately. But it was an excellent school and it probably produced more officers than even West Point or Annapolis throughout the years. Carl Benson, who was one of our famous 50-year congressmen, was a graduate of GMC also, and Sam Nunn and others had been participants there. But uh, when I came back to Milledgeville, After the war. After the war, I was approached, uh, I was a Purple Heart veteran, and I was approached about running for Congress. You were wounded twice, weren't you? I was wounded twice on Saipan and Okinawa. And they asked me to run against Carl Vinson, who today, as I stated, we look upon as really the man who brought about the Two Seas Navy, and he was really an advocate that made us strong. They wanted it, you to run for U.S. Congress one against wanted me to run against Mr. Vinson. They felt like it was a feeling, and of course this is in 1946, that Mr. Benson had sent all their sons off to World War II, and a lot of them hadn't come back, and then there had been a lot of problems in insurance for soldiers. In other words, you didn't have to take out. Today, you automatically get your insurance when you join in the Army. But back in World War II, you could sign up for 10000 5000 or you didn't have to sign up at all. And you can imagine when one neighbor a uh, son got killed and they got ten thousand dollars and the next old neighbor's son got killed and they didn't get anything. Yes, sir. I mean, uh, they couldn't understand it and con they had to blame somebody so Congressman Benson was the one they used to blame. But these gentlemen came to me. They had had some fusses with Mr. Benson. They were in the uh, paper wood business. Is this 46? This is in 1946. Yes, sir. And I went to Washington. Stayed up there nearly 10 days to make up my mind, and I came back and decided that Washington wasn't place for me. <laughs> and uh, so I wasn't going to run for anything, but then a group of veterans came and asked me to run for the House. Were these people whom you had been in the war with? They, no, these are people that were, were veterans from Baldwin County. Okay. I was to run, at that time, we had the, the county unit system, and Baldwin County was a four-unit county, which meant that we had two representatives. Units were based upon your population. Now, one of our representatives through the years had been smart enough to get the population at what was known then as Milledgeville State Hospital, which today is Central State Hospital, to be counted in the population. The and inmate the, population. The inmate counted. population was 12,000 a little over 12,000. So Baldwin County would have ordinarily been a two-unit county with one representative, but due to this representative being smart enough to say we need to count the population at Milledgeville State Hospital, they were a four-unit county, and we had two, two representatives. Now, at this time, one of them was named Marion Ennis, Marion had been in 12 or 14 years. He was an attorney, very competent, good legislator, very smart, but he was not too personable. He would be a man that would walk down the street and would be thinking about other things and forget to speak to people and things of that nature. The other one was known as Captain Ennis. Now, Captain Ennis had been in and were out. Were they related? They, they were uncles or something. They were distantly related. Yes, sir. Captain Ennis was a member, had been a member in and out of the Senate. Now, this was when the Senate revolved. In other words, you'd be in two years, then you'd be out four. Three counties made up a senatorial district. 
Now, of course, 26 years ago, the courts ruled that the Georgia Senate was malapportioned, and we reapportioned the Senate, where it became a continuing body, and that was when I was elected. 62. 26 years ago, that's correct. But we ran against, we, boy named Sidley Jennings, a young fellow, he was but about 24 years of age. I was about 32, I believe. And we ran against the Ennises, and we ran a terrific race. To both Did you run against the captain or not? I, I ran against Mary, and I, I ran against the younger one, and the, the one that presumably they were grooming him to be take Carl Vincent's place. And the general opinion was that they couldn't be beaten. And uh, a doctor there that was uh, run, ran politics in Baldwin County, he thought, was very active in the Ennis's campaign, and he was had the only hospital in Milledgeville, and he had all the, mention his name? <laughs> uh, all the doctors worked for him. His name was Dr. Richard Binion, and he ran Binion Clinic. He and my father had been bitter enemies through the years, but for some reason during World War II, they got to be excellent friends. And the fact is, Dr. Binion sent me some packages overseas, and couldn't wait for me to get back, and of course, I was shot up on Okinawa, came back to the hospital in Saipan, then came to Letterman General in Frisco, and my father died at 52 years of age before I got back. But anyway, going back to Dr. Binion, he uh, said, stated that if I ran against Mr. Ennis, that he was going to bring Jacob Drug Company into Milledgeville and put me out of business. <laughs> well, I might not have run, because I wasn't particularly interested in politics anyway, but you know, being a Bolshevik, uh, my dandruff sort of got up because he threatened me, so then I had to run. And we ran the race, and ran a terrific race. I knocked on every county and go in Baldwin County. In fact, is some of them thought I was a member of the family because I came by at lunchtime and ate lunch with them so often. And we ended up, Jennings and I, beating the Ennises three to one, something they thought was an impossibility. And that started me on my political career. Jennings himself ran one more time. Then he went into the service and he retired three years ago as a Brigadier General. He was another graduate from Georgia Military College, and he's retired in Milledgeville at this time. Were there any particular issues in that first campaign that yes, stand out in your mind course, that might have made a difference? Of course, the main issues. Now, those what, what really I think brought about me winning was this, that Central State Hospital, which didn't wait for about 1,200 1, people, very few people, they had about eight or ten doctors was all, yet you had 12,000 patients. So it was really just a warehouse of individuals. Understaffed was a big problem. Very understaffed, you, no doctors you might speak of. And if it was not for the dedicated uh, employees, you know, we called them attendants back there then, they're known as ho hospital service technicians today. But the attendants were really the only one that was able to give any attention or any type of personal care to the patients. And it was uh, very run down. Uh, the buildings were bad. It had no air condition. Uh, the pavement, they were making $80 a month. They were putting in about 16 to 18 hours a day. And it, it was a bad situation. So I, I ran on this basis. Plus, we ran, you, you picked issues, you know, and I had uh, checked Mr. Ennis's record pretty closely, and he had missed a vote on the farm of being able to get his, not have to pay uh, state tax on the gasoline he used on the farm. Now, Baldwin County is not a farming area, but to say that this man, because he claimed that he went to the dentist that day and didn't get the vote. But that was quite an issue, and uh, we blew that up. Well, on but the hospital, did you you were going to upgrade the condition of the attendants? Was that you going to condition? raise them to $125 a month? I see. We were going to get additional help. We were going to clean it up. And I go out to the hospital. A fellow named, uh, oh, Doctor, the, the superintendent anyway, uh, Doctor Yabra. 
refused to let me go into the hospital and shake hands with the employees. This is why you were a candidate. This is why I'm a candidate in campaigning. But he had let my opponent, in fact is, took him through and uh, introduced him to all of them. So naturally I picked this up as a discriminatory and not fair. And two days later, Dr. Yarber called me and invited me to come out and go through, but naturally I refused because I had me an issue that I could really go to bat with. And was that played up in the local newspapers? Local that? newspaper, and we used the radio quite a bit back mm -hmm. then. The radio was very uh, prominent. People listened to it because TV hadn't come into what it has today. So we used that, and then we ha had a song. We vote for Kid and Jennings, and we put it on a truck and had it to go all over town and because we had the issues into it, it related to our campaign. And you had all the young people in town following the truck and singing Vote for Kid and Jennings and of course as we stated we blew the blew the Ennises out as well as Dr. Benjamin and a few other people that were against us then. <laughs> when you, uh, 46, when you got to the State House, that was the time of the two governors. That's when I came in in 47, that was when you know that uh, Eugene Talmadge had died, and uh, we had just elected the first lieutenant governor, which was Amy Thompson, and yet Herman continued that uh, the Constitution was not clear, that he had received, which he had some five or six hundred votes, this is Herman, for governor. He was put in, but they knew his daddy was sick, and that there was a chance that he might not be sworn in. So they had people to go and vote for Herman. And so his contention was that he was a logical governor because he had gotten votes for governor. Emmy Thompson was had no votes for governor. Uh, his daddy had not been sworn in, therefore Emmy could not take over. So we came up and met in the legislature. Every morning we'd meet at 9 o'clock, we'd take a vote. And there was just one vote difference between the Thompson people and the Talmadge people. Which side what, were you on? I, I was for Talmadge. Talmadge is a year older than I am. We a friend of M.E. Thompson, and he made quite a few concessions to Jennings and myself that we had uh, uh, voted with him. But we thought that possibly at that time that Talmadge was correct. We were not as familiar with the job of Lieutenant Governor as we are now. Of course, the two governor deals finally went to court, and the court ruled for Emmy Thompson. And we we worked with Emmy during that. See, the session was gone before it went into court the first year, and the second year we did practically nil. Herman ran that year and was elected for two years. The balance of that term when he beat Emmy, and then Herman came back and was re-elected for a full term. So we did have the Talmadge influence that I worked with for quite a period of time. Now, the legislation that I was so much interested in, as well as getting additional funds for Millersville State Hospital, I my first talk on the floor of the House was to, as I stated, raise the salaries of the employees for to $125. To my utter amazement, the House at that time was 205 members. As you know, since then, it's been cut to 180. But to my amazement of the 12,000 patients, of which only approximately 50 or 60 of them were from Baldwin County, the members of the House got up and stated, said, this is not Georgia's problem. This is Milledgeville's problem. Yet these patients came from every county in the state of Georgia. Of course, we realized that possibly the problem was calling it the Milledgeville State Hospital. Of course, we changed the name later to the Central State Hospital, but that was after we got regional hospitals. But also, back in those days, uh, when you had mental illness, you were known as being crazy or a lunatic. In fact, is the name of the hospital in Milledgeville was called the Lunatic Asylum. That's when it first opened up. And I, I was amazed. I had an uncle named Culver from Hancock County, served on the board there to begin with. 
But we were working towards trying to get the proper approach to mental illness. The Menningers out in Kansas had brought Kansas from low on the total pole dealing with mental illness the to the clinic. clinic and the doctors. We went out and met with them personally and of course one of his great remarks that we have used through the years was to have brains before bricks. And this is something we've tried to approach here in Georgia and not too successful sometimes, that we needed competent, capable people to do the job before we start building buildings that we didn't have good people to put into it. But we were, with the, with the help of other senators, we were able to pass new laws and deal with mental illness as it should be as an illness. It was not something that people should be ashamed of, that should hide the people in the closet. And today we know that it can be cured in most cases and we're approaching it properly. However, with the improvements we've got in approach to mental illness, most of the patients you have today are what we call long-term patients. They are mostly bedridden. There's very little you can do for them. But when you start talking about long-term care, certain people throw their arms up because they think you're putting them in an institution and leaving them there without treatment. But this is not true. These are people that really, you're not going to ever be able to put them out on the street in most cases, but they do need to get better care because some of our institutions, our regional hospitals, we call them revolving door policy that they come in one door and come out the next about three days later. And this is not right because, to me, mental illness or no illness can be treated, say, 29 days you're going to get out or less. E each one has to be evaluated. And we are working today to take one of the buildings that's in very good shape at Central State Hospital and make it into a long-term care facility for the entire state of Georgia. We feel that there's approximately 400 patients that will fall into this category, and this particular building will hold right now, without spending a dime on it, around 250, and could be made with the expenditure of little money, it could hold 350. You're going to propose that this term? This is something we're working towards. We have already talked with the human resources, Dr. Gates, and our mentally, um, mentally ill people that are working with it and they agree and the reason we haven't moved until now is a particular building that we want to utilize for this. We had one building was called the Bostic building which kept our elderly patients in and the prison system as we all know has grown so and we have over 3,500 prisoners on the central state campus in some of the buildings that were utilized by the mentally ill. And they needed to take over this Bostic building pretty quick like. So we reworked this particular building we're referring to and put the elderly into it. But in the meantime, we've let a contract on what's known as the Boone Building, which should be completed this year. And the patients, the elderly patients, will be moved into the Boone Building. That'll be for long-term care for the elderly? No. no the, these are not those that are, you, you might say, that are not ambulatory. They are ambulatory, most of them are. But the building they are in would be turned over to the long-term care facility as soon as they move into the Boone Building. This would be our move, which we hope will be this next year, because this is something needs to be done and something we've been looking forward. We have two areas that I think that we have been negligent in in Georgia, we have had to really put our focus and our money into the prison system because of court pressure and requirements. And we have so many prisoners sitting there, so we have put a lot of money. And in doing this, we have, I think, in my own opinion, neglected to keep our mental health program up to date, such as a long-term care, and also, we're very bad in providing care for head injury. You take, we only have 10 beds in the state of Georgia for head injury. What we've done, which is improper, but it's about the only thing you could do, someone that would be in a trauma with a head injury case 
and they'd go to a hospital and the insurance runs out. The family's got no money. What, where, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We can't put them out on the street. Most of them are elderly. They can't take care of them at home, the patients. So we've been putting them in some of your mental institutions as being mentally ill. But this was not right, and this was not true, but you had no other place to go. So we are hoping, and I, if necessary, I'm waiting now for the Department of Human Resources Board to meet on uh, head injury cases to see if legislation is needed in order to license some nonprofit groups or how are we going to approach it. We have other buildings. We have another building that was called the Jones Building at Central State. It used to be the hospital building. Now, it, we built a new building, which is now known as the Cub Kid Building. Uh, well, it was finished quite a few years ago, but the Jones Building could be utilized as a head injury trauma area. And we've got to do this, and we need to do it now and not let it continue to wait. And this is an area that I would probably introduce legislation, if necessary, this next session. So you've been introducing legislation having to do with the hospital since your first time. Was that first one initially successful to raise salaries and so forth in the first you session? You know, we didn't. We took two years to get the salaries increased. But during this period of time, not only was the salary is low, but conditions were terrible. Mm -hmm. Rats, filth, everything. Mm -hmm. And we, as you usually do, you know, you have to really be, get sensational if you're going to get the attention of your political leaders. I hate to say that, but that's the truth. Not a question of need, or a question of where it should go, it's a question of how much mileage or how much attention can I get out of this. And it was a problem. We, we the, the feeling was uh, it's been there. Uh, we've been getting by, so let it get by. So we call in the news media, and the Macon Telegraph was very cooperative and did some great stories. But we really did not get the attention of the state of Georgia until we called in the boy from the Atlanta Constitution named Jack Nelson. Jack Nelson came down to Milledgeville, Georgia, and stayed about two weeks and wrote sensational stories and won the Pulitzer Prize over the stories that he wrote about, the conditions and needs of Central State Hospital. So through the news media, through bringing the public's attention to it and getting the General Assembly cognizance of what's needed now. In later years, I started and invited members of the General Assembly to come into Milledgeville. We split the General Assembly, the House and Senate up into two groups and bring them in for a two-day period so they could know personally. This is something that I think we miss today. We used to, in the old days, we owned property up in uh, Chattanooga. We had the railroad station, a lot of property, and I was on a committee on institution and property, and we'd go up there and check this property. You say we, you mean the state? Only? The, the committee, uh, the House committee and Senate committee that dealt with the institutions. And the same was true with, uh, we'd go down on the coast and see the property we had there. But today, we've got members voting on funding so many different things that they're not familiar with. I, I blame the city of Atlanta for an example. The city of Atlanta, we talk about two Georgias. I don't think it could ever be two Georgias. I think we're all Georgia, and that we move together as Georgia, because Atlanta is the captain, the leader, the train. You might say that's pulling the rest of us, but we move together. And members of the General Assembly need to know more about Atlanta. For example, we have been on some MARTA rides, but uh, MARTA has increased. We need to know more about MARTA. Uh, recently, I asked for an example. You go out to Hartsville Air Force Air Base, and you look at the walls out there and think of the thousands of people who travel in and out of there, and the few murals that got up there, you don't know where they came from King Tut's tomb or just where they came from. So I had been on a tourism trip out to uh, the West Coast. And I came back and saw those walls.
See what Georgia has to offer, and maybe they'll stay a while and spend a little money.